This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, where we study, read, and try to encourage you to read uh, various books, usually in the canon of economics, and particularly Austrian economics, but sometimes we go into uh, related fields of politics and sociology and logic and philosophy and wherever the mood takes us. So this week, I'm very pleased to have as our guest, Donald Devine. He has a brand new 2021 book, actually, called The Enduring Tension, which I want to recommend to you and bring your attention to and hopefully summarize some of its main theses and concepts today. For those who are not familiar with Mr. Devine and his work, he's currently at the Fund for American Studies. Uh, He's also a fellow at Heritage. Uh, He was probably most famously head of OPM, the Office of Personal Management, which really controls the civil service element of the federal government uh, back during the Reagan administration. And he received some uh, uh, less than flattering commentary from the left during his tenure there as he was trying to wrestle that beast to the ground a bit. Uh, And from my perspective, you know, during my time in Washington, D.C., working for Ron Paul, Donald Devine was really one of those names you knew in conservatism. Some of what, one of those heralded names like a Richard Vigory or a Morton Blackwell or a David Keene, Donald Devine was very much uh, s- sort of one of the guys behind the guys. And uh, so I'm thrilled that he's written this new book. It was recommended to me and I got an opportunity to, to read it over the weekend. And it is called The Enduring Tension, Capitalism and the Moral Order. So it really fits, I think, a nexus for our listeners uh, in grappling with this idea that uh, you know, libertarianism and markets are not sufficient, that there are cultural and religious and traditional elements to everything we do, and that society needs those things. And I think this is a point that's often lost uh, amongst libertarians, especially. So all that said, wordy on my end, Don, it's great to talk to you and thank you. Well, it's great to be here, Jeff. Uh, name Mises is very important to me. Uh, you mentioned I was the head of the civil service of bureaucracy for Reagan. It's actually Ludwig von Mises who taught me uh, about the running government. He, he has a book not too many people know. It. Uh, the simple title is called Bureaucracy. It was published by Yale University Press. Uh, and it is the only wisdom, really, uh, a very few uh, uh, wisdoms on the bureaucracy. It uh, tells you everything you have to know. Uh, and the basic thing is that government is different than than markets. <laughs> uh, I could actually go into that more. It's a great book. He basically says the problem is in the in the government. There's no way to communicate between the person uh, at the top who's running the organization and making the decision, uh, and the people who were are the ones that are supposed to be helped or serviced. Uh, the bottom in the government, it can be 15, 20, 30 uh, levels from the uh, secretary of an agency to the bottom. Of, and uh, there's no communication device in the government. In the private sector, uh, although the private usually has fewer levels, but in the private sector, you can go down as far as you want because all you have to do is answer a simple question. Is it making uh, a profit or not. And if it's not making a profit, then you have to do something, uh, maybe get rid of it. And the government, if you go down and look at it, and if you can get through it all, when you go down and you find out something's going wrong, there's a universal answer. You, you throw more money at it. You throw more money after bed. So it's just a wonderful little book. But anyway... I guess we'll get back to my book. <laughs> well, one of the reasons it might be little is people have alleged that in, in 1944, when it was published, Yale was looking for small books because there were paper shortages. So that uh, not necessarily that we know that for a fact, but that's been suggested. Now, d- during your time at OPM, did you come to believe it, it was hopeless or did you think something could be done about officialdom? The deep state, call it what you will. The biggest thing, and I have this in this book, too. I have a whole chapter on bureaucracy, and it's very critical to my thesis. Uh, And it simply is that government, centralized government, uh, uh, 
and especially how much we've grown it since the welfare state over the last hundred years or so. Uh, it can't work with so many levels and no way to communicate. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you can make government work better, uh, but you can't really do anything unless you get rid of uh, so many things that do. You know, Ronald Reagan said that when he ran for president, he says, I'm running uh, uh, to cut government, yes, to save money, and but mainly I'm trying to make it work. We got to get most of the government out of Washington and into the states and into the localities. Uh, um, and I think that's the only real thing. We've got to cut it in major, major ways uh, and have to reform things like uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, get back to some more stable currency based to some degree on gold or other uh, objective measures. Uh, we got a long way off the direction uh, the, the founders set up with a very limited central government, uh, most government, uh, state and local level, and really most of society, as the great de Tocqueville said, uh, uh, done by private uh, voluntary associations and very, very local village type government where people can have an effect uh, the only way you can make the government work uh, is to slim it down and, and then you can put some uh, reasonable kind of uh, solutions uh, one of which uh, is to take down all the barriers to doing anything in the, the government uh, uh, I actually went back into the government for a couple of months at the end of the Trump administration. They finally got somebody in the White House personnel office that knew what he was doing. Uh, so they asked me to come in and take a look at it. And it's so much worse. It's, it's even worse than before uh, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, passed his Civil Service Reform Act, which did a lot of good things. Uh, and allowed us in the Reagan administration to do things nobody's been able to do since. For example, getting rid of 100,000 non-defense employees. Uh, but my book is trying to look at this in a bigger direction. It, that doesn't work, uh, and therefore we have to look for other things uh, that can work. Um, the easy answer is decentralization and privatization. Uh, uh, that's what made us great, and we've gotten too far away from it, and that's got to be our lodestar to make it different. But to do that, you, I think you have to go back and look seriously at philosophy and history, uh, understand how we got there. Part of the problem today is so few people know anything about history. Uh, uh, back when... I first got in politics, which admittedly was a long time ago. Uh, uh, everybody read uh, the activist people, especially. But uh, you know, one of the things Frederick Hayek, uh, probably uh, in the public sphere, is the one that kind of reinvented uh, this kind of libertarian conservatism that I identify with. Uh, uh, he was the first. He wrote a, a, an academic kind of book, uh, but that book got to the guy who was in charge of the biggest circulation magazine in America. It was called Reader's Digest. I mean, people were reading, uh, hmm. and he serialized that book. Uh, and that book, uh, through that operation, got in the hands of. People like uh, William Buckley and Frank Meyer, who kind of popularize it, uh, um, and uh, uh, um, into Ronald Reagan's hands, uh, as he himself says. Uh, so we need to realize that history. We need to uh, really go back much earlier. How we, how capitalism uh, was formed, was named. After uh, named by uh, actually uh, Karl Marx, mm -hmm. the father of communism, socialism, uh, um, and that's kind of where I start in the book with him. Uh, I think this is an interesting time for lovers of freedom uh, 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 and worry about where 
the country's going. Uh, Democrats have an incredibly big agenda, and they control uh, all the uh, both houses of Congress and the president. Uh, believers in freedom are going to have a limited amount of ability to do anything. It's a good time to read, to go back, to think the basic thoughts, to get away with our politics now, which is really just kind of slogans rather than uh, serious thought, uh, and recognize that it's not little kind of tweaks here and there, or even throwing uh, big amounts of money. That isn't the problem. The problem is the structure itself doesn't work. Centralization doesn't work. Uh, Reagan always said it again, what uh, made America great was federalism, uh, the whole idea of separation of powers at the national level. and uh, Most things done now near the people where they can have some effect on what's going on. So that's kind of where my book is coming from. Well, you actually start in the introduction by discussing Joseph Schumpeter and his admonition about creative destruction and what would potentially bring down the West. So with all the the hindsight we have now, do you think Schumpeter was correct? Yeah, I, I actually, I think we're at the end of an era. Uh, the progressives uh, uh, have been in charge a long time. Uh, uh, probably the most important American intellectual since the founders was Woodrow Wilson. Uh, uh, many know that he was uh, president of the United States. They, they tend to forget that he was a great intellectual leader, as a president of Princeton University. Instrumental in starting the American uh, Society of Public Administration, the American Political Science Association, and many other academic. Uh, and, and it was he who who went to uh, Prussia, actually, uh, in Europe, uh, and, and said, "Hey, you know, Prussia works." When the, the Chancellor and the, the Kaiser decides something, it gets done. Uh, over here, we have all these checks and balances uh, against power. Uh, uh, we can't get anything done. So he says the Constitution's fatal flaw is dividing power rather than bringing it together. Um, and he convinced uh, American intellectuals uh, of that, and they've been trying to do various things uh uh, ever since to to make centralized government work, um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, Joe Biden is going to prove that it can't work. Uh, uh, it's at the end of its exhaustion. We're uh, uh, just over a hundred years now with the Federal Reserve, and as I say in the book and quote some uh, past uh, leaders in the. Uh, Federal Reserve, they don't have any ability to react anymore. They have so much debt uh, piled up there and obligations uh, for those debt. Uh, there's no room. You have the head of the Federal Reserve now admitting publicly uh, that monetary policy doesn't work anymore and we can only uh, deal with fiscal. He's uh, the big cheerleader behind the uh, uh, throwing uh, almost two uh, trillion, which we never even saw a couple of years ago, two trillion, not billion dollars. Uh, uh, we're at the point that this old welfare state is exhausted, uh, and it's going to be up to Joe Biden to prove it. Uh, and I just hope that the shocks that we have to go through to do it are not going to be uh, too absolutely painful. So the title, The Enduring Tension, relates, I think, to fusionism. So explain to our listeners what you mean by the tension, sort of the twin poles of uh, markets and freedom and tradition and, and morality. Yeah, a lot of people call this fusionism. Uh, but what this really is is Western civilization. Western civilization has always been this tension between freedom and tradition uh, uh, between markets uh, and government between this moral idea uh, uh, that freedom is something important, uh, that tradition uh, is important, uh, and, and that tension 
uh, not all one, not all the other. Uh, that tension has been really the, the spark of all Western civilization, and that's why I go into so much history uh, on this. Uh, uh, and, it, and it is this tension, even critics uh, admit that it is this tension that that gives it its vitality. You know, a lot of them don't like this vitality. In fact, uh, part of the problem is, is that this idea of freedom is scary. The idea that, that people can be free, uh, they, they may not do uh, all the right things. Uh, um, mm-hmm. Uh, the influence of Judaism and Christianity and Western civilization, uh, this idea that, that this a, a creator gives you the ability, uh, the freedom to, to not follow him. Now, what kind of God is this? Uh, he's giving you the freedom uh, to disobey him. Uh, I mean, no place else has this, this kind of idea. Uh, uh, and that's why this freedom has a, a moral base, uh, uh, but it needs something to control that. Uh, and at least uh, some of those people think that uh, he also gave them part of those reasons, the uh, Ten Commandments uh, and the whole structure of religion uh, and uh, uh, private associations, families, uh, Communities, uh, 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 these all are in a, a balance, a tension, uh, a fusion, if you wish. Uh, 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 th- this is what made the uh, West uh, great and, and why progressivism, uh, the welfare state, uh, it, tries to, it, it tries to cover that freedom so that it, it, it has to follow the the leadership of the experts uh, who supposedly know everything, and I spend a lot in the book also on science and the scientific reasons why uh, they can't do these things. Uh, uh, so, as I say, I, I think it's a good time for people who realize the importance of freedom to sit back and, and really be serious about what uh, you need to do to preserve that freedom and, and to recognize that we've gone a long way off track and we've got to make some serious changes if we're going to uh, survive the 21st century. Do you think the size of the United States, 330-ish million people, is that a big part of the problem? Well, so, uh, absolutely. The bigger the population is, the more difficult it is to run it from the top. If you had only a hundred people who were Americans, well, maybe you could run everything from the top then, or certainly be a lot easier. Uh, but as society grows, you need it more, and especially federalism. Uh, I mean, having one plan to do everything just doesn't work. And, you saw the, 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 the Trump administration, he wasn't uh, sophisticated uh, about uh, public administration, uh, but he had enough sense to realize that you can't run this whole COVID thing from the center and have one rule for everybody. Uh, now, uh, uh, Joe Biden ran criticizing that, saying he was going to centralize. Oh, Biden isn't uh, having a... Uh, isn't doing that. He, he's afraid. He knows he can't. Do you, I mean, you can't have the same rules for people in South Dakota as you have in New York City. I mean, you just can't. It makes no sense. Uh, and yet that's what progressivism says we should do. Have the one master plan and everybody follows and, uh, and follows the experts. Uh, and of course, the fact is the experts disagree all of their great uh, 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 statistical things are statistics. They, they're probabilities. They're, they're not absolutes. Uh, um, and we've got this really uh, uh, outmoded idea of science, uh, that science is something that is absolute and precise. Uh, in modern times, we know that uh, 
science is probabilistic. It doesn't answer every question. In fact, you can have a probability relationship between two uh, uh, principles uh, in which no one uh, uh, fact faces uh, uh, the general uh, tendency, the the average. Uh, everything's below it or above it. Uh, so it, it that's can't be the way you have to deal with facts and that's the great great value of the market that the market allows individuals to make decisions each one of us decides what we're going to spend it on and we make our own decisions based on uh, the realities that we face uh, and what's uh, available that other free people are making available or not making available uh, and why the market is so important and why capitalism, with all its problems, uh, is, is clearly the, the best kind of uh, approach to economics. Uh, uh, we've gone a long way uh, uh, away from Mises and Hayekian ideas of the market, uh, but the basic structure's there, and we make some changes uh, especially in terms of over-regulation, uh, uh, we can get back to a market and get back on the, the right track uh, uh, for freedom and for the good of society. Well, what's interesting here is that I think left critics would consider Schumpeter and Hayek both to be extreme market liberals. But at the same time, both Schumpeter and Hayek recognize that we need something more than just markets. It's not enough. We need some sort of uh, tradition or morality or religion holding us together. And I think one of the big points you make in this book is we don't have a real good sense of what that something is these days. Yeah, I mean, it's very clear uh, uh, that they're different. Uh, take an interesting example. A Wall Street Journal uh, a couple of months ago uh, uh, had a... Uh, uh, an article by somebody who was close to Milton Friedman. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, a general kind of thing, but one thing really hit me on it. He said, you know, uh, Milton Friedman originally had the idea that markets will change everything. If you just put in freedom and markets, uh, that's enough. Um, and he predicted that in China, that the as they got into and put more uh, uh, market elements into it, they would gradually get there. But this fellow who was a close associate of, of Milton Friedman, said that uh, towards the end of his life, Milton said, you know, that was wrong. You can't get uh, there only by adopting markets. Uh, you have to have a whole rule of law. Now, this is, to me, it was a shocking thing, and I've been meaning to write about but I and displayed it on too many other things. Uh, but, uh, I mean, what an incredible admission that the, the kind of a, a market only uh, guy like Milton Friedman, at the top of the, uh, the group on that, uh, came to agree with Hayek and others that the rule of law, that some kind of moral structure of rules uh, is necessary. Uh, um, as I say, I think a great admission by one of the most important thinkers of our time. It was, you know, right on ninety percent or more of everything. Uh, but it, but it's just not enough to have market freedom. You have to have a whole structure of morality built into a rule of law, respects private property, that makes people uh, not uh, push the. the around to uh, take advantage of people. You need a whole moral structure of, uh, or capitalism can't work. Well, you and you get into that. You have a whole chapter, chapter six, on moralizing capital. I, I was interested to see that you quoted Mark Lilla, whom I consider an interesting left progressive. I actually read his book, The Once and Future Liberal. So it, the, uh, you know, the question here is, what, what's our moral foundation? Is it Thomas Aquinas? Uh, well, maybe, but as America gets increasingly secular, and I think by design, uh, 
where are we going to find that? Well, I don't know if you can find it secularly. Uh, um, but what it can't be is some kind of top-down uh, uh, religion that everybody uh, is forced to join and have the state support it. Uh, it it's very important that the state not uh, uh, dominate religion uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't have many different uh, varieties of religion. Uh, and, of course, there are a lot of things that consider themselves secular that aren't. Uh, I mean, actually, communism is a religion. Uh, uh, the great Eric Vogelin, the uh, historian, is very clear that uh, you can't escape uh, religion. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be... be uh, uh, one like uh, Christianity or Judaism, uh, uh, fascism uh, is a kind of religion. Uh, so you need some uh, kind of moral uh, system, uh, and it certainly doesn't have to be in a single organization. Uh, 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 but, but what it needs to do is is, is uh, tolerance. Uh, and as you know, if you read the book, uh, that um, my big person is John Locke. John Locke, uh, most people consider him totally uh, secular, uh, but he wasn't. Uh, uh, but what he believed in was tolerance. Uh, 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 it can have many different varieties of this moral. They need something, something related around the... Uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, which are uh, kind of the formal writing down, but uh, uh, many structural societies had a lot of aspects of that. Uh, some of social scientists believe that uh, the central ones are universal. I'm not sure about that. But my point is that you need a morality in society, and it doesn't have to be one single found fact uh, uh, f- uh, requiring only one uh, uh, will always uh, give you more problems than not. Uh, um, so I, I think we have, you know, the, to many people um, believing in, in environmentalism is kind of a religion. Uh, 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 you, you need some kind of moral structure, and I, I think you probably need. Uh, something close to uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, uh, maybe uh, including deism. Uh, uh, but you need some idea that, uh, that there's something beyond pure individual uh, self-interest. Uh, the idea of a creator, uh, it's right in our Declaration of Independence. That that's where it all comes from. Uh, and if there isn't some kind of creation, maybe even a deist creation, uh, 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 then there's no value. I mean, um, what is anything worth? So I, I think that uh, religion is going to be a big, big part of this, uh, and probably uh, uh, in America where it's uh, embedded so deep, something along the Judeo-Christian tradition, and again, maybe even including deism. Uh, uh, but you need some kind of structure, uh, uh, a moral structure. Now, you mentioned COVID and the Trump administration. One of the things they actually did well was allowing governors to take the lead on that. Does this give you any hope? I mean, we see people moving out of blue states into red. We see people rejecting the public school monopoly. We see various governors uh, you know, tweeting at each other and accusing each other and this sort of thing. This, is COVID perhaps the silver lining uh, w- will be that we've, we've started to look more at states again? Well, you know, that's a very good observation. Uh, I, I think you're right. I think this is, uh, it, it's making it so clear that one solution for all doesn't work. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see where uh President Biden ends up on all this. Uh, is he going to really try to crack down? And I, I think he's already kind of moved away from it. But um, 
I mean, if you can get the Democratic president to recognize that uh, you can't do everything from Washington, uh, we may be starting, maybe slowly, but uh, moving back in the right direction. You know, when we think about liberalism in the Hayekian sense of the word, not in the, maybe the modern sense of the word, one of the big criticisms going around today on the right, there are critics of National Review, what they call conservative ink. I'm sure you've heard that. But, you know, one of the criticisms is that, hey, liberalism ha- has failed to stop illiberalism. It lets all these left-wing woke types take over the universities, lets them take over culture, lets them take over media, lets them take over civil service. And so uh, we need to question the kind of liberalism that Hayek and Mises talked about because it hasn't worked. Well, I think it worked for a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. What happened is that people who thought it uh, it didn't work uh, took over the the intellectual and the political uh, uh, worlds again. And they go back to uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, was trying to help people to do something good, but uh, and they tried it out, and they've had a hundred years, and I think. We now know that it doesn't work. Uh, once you pile it up too much uh, uh, and you promise everything, you, you have to realize that you've got to turn out beyond the central government. Uh, um, and if you don't, you're going to pay a price for it. So final question. If you had to give people words of advice, people who believe in human freedom, but people who also think there's a moral component you know, you mentioned earlier that it's a great time to get back to reading, and I concur with that completely. We can't rebuild the world, you know, without a foundation. But, you know, if if you if people say, you know, Donald Devine, you've been around, you've been in Washington, you've seen how the sausage gets made, you've seen all this left-right nonsense, you've seen Reagan come and go, uh, you know, tell me, let's say a young person who is starting out at age 20 right now, what would what would you tell him or her? Well... For the immediate term, I'd say, don't get in debt. Mm, yes. uh, I think we're going to, it, it's going to be a hard thing for people to to realize that what we've been doing for so long is wrong. And they're going to be shakeups and shakedowns. The first thing I think uh, I would tell somebody young is be very prudent economically uh, because you're going to be in for some shocks. And I don't want to hear that, but uh, I think that's, uh, on a personal level, uh, the most important thing. The second thing I, I would say is uh, uh, reading. When I started out uh, activism and uh, politics, uh, almost everyone read. I mean, people read uh, Hayek, I mean, uh, seriously, uh, and, and people of that... Uh, uh, that caliber, um, even at a lower level, a more popular like William Buckley or even Barry Goldwater's book, which was written by a, an, a, an intellectual uh, helping him. Um, was that Brent Bazell wrote that? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, um, uh, and everybody read. It, it's just so important to read. You know, I think what made Ronald Reagan so different from all the other recent presidents we've had uh, is he read you know I don't mean to be too critical but you know George W. Bush according to uh, his uh, advisor had to tell him to start reading when he was president Mm -hmm. I mean you need to start reading now if you're 20 uh, uh, and you can't just deal with tweets and simple messages you have to dig into it uh, my that's why my book is tough. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be an easy read. Uh, uh, well, let's read something that isn't so tough. Uh, uh, but you need to read. You can't uh, understand unless you know something about history and philosophy, uh, politics, government. Uh, these are all things that are so important uh, in your life. Uh, 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 and I wouldn't worry too much about politics the next couple of years. Uh, uh, Democrats are in control of both houses of Congress and the president. Uh, uh, they're going to be very hard to convince. Uh, 
guess those people involved in that could still do it. But uh, and this is the time to think, you know, in the in the Reagan administration, I mean, in the uh, Bush administration, we got awful lazy. We're just throwing quotes around and symbols, and uh, we weren't talking. Uh, depth, we were talking slogans. Uh, and again, this is a time to think. Uh, there's going to be plenty of time for action in a few years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the book, again, is called The Enduring Tension, Capitalism, and the Moral Order. It's just out this year, 2021, by Encounter Books. It's available on Amazon. It's a absolutely fantastic cover. I love the cover, and I really enjoyed reading it. I think there's a lot to think about here for all of us who are worried, who are concerned about human freedom. So, Don Devine, I want to thank you so much for your time and hope everybody has a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.